Yeah. Welcome to my world. Well, see, that's funny because at Grave Creek, there's a uh, museum. And there's a big sign right when you walk in. There never was any giants. There was never any giants found in this map. There were never any giants found anywhere. This is big disclaimer about giants. And I have a photo before that museum was built. It was the Dondora Museum. And they had on display a skeleton that was seven foot two in the museum. And when they, in the 1830s, there was a guy who actually dug into the side of Grave Creek. And the earth is packed so tight in there that he built the museum and he displayed the eight and a half foot giant was on display in that map. Well, LA and I were walking out of the museum and they had a lithograph that had to be from like the 1840s, but it showed the giant that was on display within that map. And it was like, oops, this lady didn't know what she was doing because you're not supposed to release stuff like that. I mean, they have all these signs about giants. And here's a picture of a giant skeleton being displayed in the mound that they're saying there's no giants in. Hi, this is Fritz Zimmerman, and you're listening to Prometheus Lens. As a podcast editor, I know what it's like for long nights and sitting at the computer and your eyes just start to go down. You're nodding out, trying your best to finish your workload. You can slam down a bunch of monsters and Red Bull and slowly kill yourself. Or you can go with God's Nectar. Kevlar Joe's Coffee Company. They're a proud sponsor of the show. Check those guys out. Many times I uh, drink me some of that Flatline Joe. Perks me up, man. Gets me going without all the jitters. Helps me power through projects. So help support the show. Help support a brother in Christ and a small business owner with Kevlar Joe's Coffee Company. What's happening and what's up? Hold out your glass because we're about to fill it up. Welcome to the Prometheus Lens Podcast with a conversation is always enlightening. Uh, Prometheus Lens is a an allegory and a play on words where basically we just re-examine everything in searching for the truth. I am your host, Justin. You probably know me from my other podcast, the Dig Bible Podcast. I'm just an independent researcher and podcaster that likes looking into fascinating things. Welcome to the hero's journey. Have you ever just looked at some of these ancient mounds and, and giants and subjects like that and just are just fascinated and want to learn as much as you can? Well, you found yourself at the right episode. I reached out to Fritz Zimmerman. This is a man with uh, with knowledge like anybody else. He's went through and documented just you know hundreds, if not thousands, of mounds in the Ohio River Valley in, in North America. So it's fascinating just to sit down with this man and pick his brain. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the ride, guys. Welcome to Prometheus Lens. In the distance looms a mystical mountain. At its peak, a great fire burns, concealing the Prometheus lens, an ancient artifact said to reveal the hidden truth within a deliberately darkened world. Join us as we travel and explore the vast unknown. It's a hero's journey with dragons to slay, damsels to save, and innumerable treasures to hoard. Torches high. The Smithsonian, they caught wind of a giant skeleton. They would send their agents out to get it. But it takes courage to move forward, to move out of the shadows, out of the 
uh, unreality that we think of as reality. Truth gets marginalized. And sometimes you have to look on the margins for the truth. We are all on the hero's journey. You know, look at it from a different perspective. A different perspective. A different perspective. A different perspective. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to another episode of the Prometheus Lens Podcast. Today, got a really exciting episode for you. Uh, Mounds and giants has always been a a fascination of mine. And ever since I discovered this man and his work, uh, it's been really eye-opening for me, especially knowing that so many of these sites are so close to me here in East Tennessee. So uh, I reached out to this gentleman, and he was nice enough to sit down and talk to us and uh, have some weird conversations and you guys know I'm all about the the weird conversations and the giants and ancient history Uh, this man he's a researcher and he's the author he has his BA in history from Purdue University with over 13 years of archaeology field work he was uh, photographing and uh, documenting almost a thousand mounds with over 200 in the Ohio River Valley alone you know he's discovered giant tombs and photographed them for the first time He's written six books, and a few of them that we'll be talking about today is the Encyclopedia of Giants in North America, the Nephilim Chronicles, Fallen Angels in the Ohio River Valley, and the Traveler's Guide to the Ancient Ruins of the Ohio River Valley, and we may even touch on some uh, mysteries of ancient America. I'd like to welcome to the show uh, Fritz Zimmerman. Thank you, Fritz. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Good to be with you. So, uh giants and mounds what uh got you into researching this topic well um i was actually going to shoot a uh short documentary uh about northern indiana and in none of my history classes did we touch on the uh mound builders but just here in northern Indiana, um, I found a couple large skeletons, and I was going to uh, sites, and I figured if I found maybe five or six burial mounds, I thought it would be a good documentary to say, you know, we have a history that dates back 2,000 years, and no one's aware of it. None of these mounds are protected or anything like that. And where I live here in Fort Wayne, we have the, some say it's the biggest genealogical library or it's about the size of the Mormon genealogical library. But what I have access to are all the county histories that was done in the late 1800s. And in those antiques, old histories they would have a section uh named antiquities where they would say were all the burial mound so they would say there was a burial mound on the lawrence farm in liberty township of noble county well i would have the plat maps for that too so i could find out where this guy lived and then kind of match that up to modern maps and then go there, knock on the door, you know, present them with the information I had. And then they would tell me if the mountain was there or wasn't there or was plowed over or whatever, you know, the case would be. So it was a lot of banging on doors. But as I expanded my search, I just kept running into more and more of these giant skeletons that they were pulling out of mound. So what started as researching five counties turned out to be 500 counties in five states. And it took me 12 years to visit about 700 sites I went to, and then I photographed 222, and 85 of those were in Indiana, 
and archaeologists only knew of 30 of them. So in the Nephilim Chronicles travel guide, at least 60%, 70% of the mounds that I photographed, that's the only place you're going to see them, is there. And then in Ohio, they had about 25 or 30 sites that were address restricted. Means, you know, they wouldn't divulge, you know, where this thing was. But through research, and um, I was able to find all of them. So all the address restricted, restricted sites, I also photographed, gave the history of the mound, and of course, everything has uh, directions on how to get there. Man, that's just. Uh, I, I just wondered, uh, do you do you have like obsessive compulsive disorder? Because like somebody like me, if I had to jump through all those hoops, man, I, I just don't know if I could do it. I mean, that was that took a lot of determination and time, and like you said, knocking on doors. Or is this just something that you're just extremely passionate about, and just had to once you started, you had to finish. Yeah, I think compulsive disorder was probably part of it. And then, uh, you know, I hate the archaeologists. I hate the fact that, you know, they're so woke and, you know, all the other things. They don't agree with any of my theories. And I really wanted to beat them at their own game. So I did the archaeological survey. They didn't. You know, I'm the one that went all to those counties. They only knew of 30. I photographed 85. So I am by far the most knowledgeable on burial mounds. And I've been to probably more burial mounds than anyone in history. So I have a good background in that. And then, like I said, you know, as I was going, you know, county by county, I just kept picking up giants. So a lot of them come from these uh, county histories that was done in the 1880s. And these were sold to, you know, the most prominent people in the county. So there was no room for people to be lying about the size of the... Uh, of the skeletons. So it was on somebody's farm. They dug into it. You know, they measured the skeleton. It was this long. And, you know, then it's printed in this history. And there would be no reason for them to lie. And probably the guy whose property was on was also prominent. Because in the 1880s, um, some of the most influential people and uh, richest people were the were the farmer, you know, back then. So I always thought that uh, those counting histories and their description of the giants was uh, uh, legitimate. In uh, Kashakton. Ohio, there was a burial mound and there were five skeletons and they're all between nine and a half and just short of 10 feet in length. And there were five people that witnessed these, uh, this mound being excavated and the uh, skeletons being measured. And in the county history, they actually signed a uh, a document that said, we were there, this is what we saw, saw the skeletons measured, you know, what's presented and their length is correct because I think they thought that future generations would not believe it. So they signed a document saying, yeah, this was true. And that was a very compelling um find as far as you know giants go and those are actually the largest giants um that were documented in ohio was mm -hmm. there 
in Stockton County. Now, you mentioned the, the mainstream archaeology, and, of course, they don't want to talk about giants. They, they deny giants. Um, why, why do you think that is with, with all the findings, all the references, whether it's you know, historical, biblical? What, what is the, the purpose or point of denial of the giants? Why is it so important? Well, one, you know, in the Bible, Genesis 6, 4, it says there were giants in those days and also after that. So one, they want to uh, swell that notion that at one time there was a race of uh, giants that were uh, roaming the earth. Um, But it goes deeper than that in the fact that the uh, geometric earthworks in Ohio um, were constructed using uh, complex mathematics. Uh, Pythagorean's theorem shows up, squared cir- circles, knowledge of pi, knowledge of square root, um, finding the circumference of a uh, circle um so there was advanced mathematics involved with these uh geometric earthwork and the people that i assign as the builders well there's the amorites who were the adena and then the hopewell were the uh dakota sioux people whose history says that they once lived in the Ohio Valley and eventually the Adena or the Amorite were absorbed by the, uh, by the Dakota Sioux. Um, but the Amorites who are mentioned in the Bible as one of the accounted giant tribes, uh, they were a real people. They had controlled Babylon from 2000 BC to 1600 BC. And that was a time of Hammurabi. And we know that they knew advanced mathematics. Actually, they found some tablets and their trigonometry was actually more advanced than what we're using today, if you can believe that. So if we go with giants who knew mathematics and then circles and squares was part of their sacred geometry and we have circles and squares um, combined in earthwork. uh, All roads lead back to Babylon and these Amorites who probably originally came here for the copper, maybe as early as 45, 2700 BC. And then that fell off around 1500 BC, 1400 BC. Um, So that was the start of it. And then we'll go right into the uh, mound building era that went anywhere from probably a thousand BC to uh, which i read in a book that uh it was on uh it was called ancient mysteries of the past and of course this was an old book this was back in the i think it was published in the 70s but it was talking about how uh the european settlers when they came here that when they discovered these mounds and were they didn't they thought they were just hills you know i mean these some of these were so massive that they couldn't even imagine that this was you know a a man-made structure and so when they started building their houses and plowing their fields and doing all this stuff they stumbled across these graves and they would not uh give credit to the indians because they thought they were just dumb stupid people but you know then you get down into the 1800s you get all these uh newspaper articles of of these finding these these giants and all these these grave sites and stuff like that um, 
do you think any of those hold any credit? And and also with with all that going on, what happened? Are the bones are just are they in some private collection somewhere of, of some millionaires tucked away, or or were they well, lying? The Smithsonian went to great lengths in Ohio and Indiana, where if they caught wind of a giant skeleton, they would send their agents out to uh, to get it, to get it, to get it. So they grab a lot of them and some of them, when they would dig down and they would, you know, uncover the skeleton, it would have the uh, consistency of like a chalk. So they couldn't remove it. They could measure it, but they really couldn't move it. And then sometimes they would dig these, skeletons up and uh there would be all these people standing around and this guy would grab a femur bone and this guy would grab a skull and this guy would grab you know this or that and they were just carted off by the by local people but um in the encyclopedia i do have photos of some that you know were actually photographed so there is some photographic evidence out there, uh, but a large skeleton, well, in Wheeling, where Grave Creek is, the Grave Creek Mound, which is the largest mound in the Ohio Valley, 70 foot, it's just incredibly huge. And it had a circle going around it or a moat, much like you see in, in, in England. And of course, we have hinges in the Ohio Valley that are identical to the hinges over in England. So the mounds and the hinges are all identical, the skull types, because these same Amorites, while they were mining copper here, they also went into uh, England. And the best book on that, of course, I put all this stuff in my book, was the Phoenician origins of the Brits and the Scots. And he attributed those mounds and Stonehenge and the mounds with the circles and the hinges and all that. He attributed those to the Amorites. And for those that missed that, he said the Amorites. You know, that's the giant clans of the Bible. So this is a uh, paradigm shifting here. If Fritz is right, he's, he's saying that not only do they have advanced building, advanced mathematics, they also was able to sail the oceans and transnavigate the, the other continents. That's pretty uh, paradigm shifting. But if this is true, it connects a lot of dots and explains a lot of things like why are we seeing pyramids on every single continent? Why are we seeing serpent imagery in every single continent religion? Why are we seeing depictions of corn in Egypt? Corn is not indigenous. This also is a whole nother rabbit trail, but it also would uh, explain why we're seeing uh, reported, I'll say that quotation, reported Egyptian artifacts and uh, carvings at the Grand Canyon. It's pretty, uh, pretty profound out there. Now, I have some theories of my own, and I've been, you know, kind of going back and forth in my head about maybe writing a book about this subject and it explains uh, an alternative view of how we see all these similarities across the world and with the Nephilim Giants. But uh, 
I'll just wait and see if I decide to write that book or not. And if, uh, if I don't, I'll pass this on beans on down the line somewhere in the episode. All right, back to the episode. And, uh, you know, pointed that out and skeletons and uh, Amorites or Amuru or Moru, um, uh, place names that were around that region of places that were named after that. Uh, places like Morocco, uh, America, where uh, in France, where those long stone rows stones and they just these huge long rows of these massive stones and then we get to america well what was that named after was they tell us it's america best you see it's like oh okay who names a country after somebody's first name so is America a Muru or Amorite? Is that the origin that was originally picked up in South America? Possible. Because the Amerigo Vespucci doesn't make much sense. America, Amerigo, it's like, well, shouldn't we be the United States of Amerigo <laughs> and not America? So that's did, not many of my book. That's just a freebie right there. Oh yeah, and uh, Vespucci, which we, I talked to uh, Heather Arnold, and she just recently moved to Aruba. She was doing some uh, research down there. She was going to start a uh, a travel company, like a tour, and she got to digging, and she found out that that the islands of Aruba used to be called the Islands of the Giants. And it was Vespucci that discovered it, and she ended up finding his uh, journals and reading in it the accounts about how when they went onto the island, they discovered these giants, and that there was uh, two young women on the beach, and that they were so tall that on their knees was uh, a head and shoulder length taller than the men, and that uh, they were friendly to them, led them back to their uh, village, where there was a bunch more giants there. It was like a clan of them. Brought them inside, and that the men had planned on confiscating or taking the two young girls to take them back to uh, Europe for, like, show and tell. But then the men came in from the, the hunt, and he described them as, you know, a good three foot taller than the women were. And that the men like chased them off they were aggressive and they ran and basically that they were shooting arrows at them as they were running through the jungle and finally made it to their ship and went to sail away that they were even going after them in the water that they had to fire off cannons at them to to scare them away but he documented in his journal that you know throughout his explorations he had seen you know human people being roasted over a fire and and been around cannibals and everything else and that he wasn't afraid as he was that of that day so it's like you hear a lot well, of you, need to, you need to send me a link to that okay yeah I'll, I'll, I'll hook you up with that that's uh yeah heather arnold she just wrote a, a book called giants of aruba and she uh discovered all this stuff and talked about it on a show with me about a year ago What's going on, guys? Thanks for listening to the Prometheus Lens Podcast. I asked if you've got anything out of this show so far and you're already subscribed, please share us with a friend. Give us a rating on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. That helps us to grow the show, get to new listeners, but it also helps us get better guests. Because a lot of times I send out emails to people and they check us out. And if we don't have a lot of good ratings and things like that, they won't even bother emailing me back. So anything you guys can do to help, I appreciate it. And if you're not a member of our members only group, I encourage you to do so. There's a lot of extra content on there. You get early access to episodes, uh, private chats, uh, early access to episodes, members only videos and episodes. It's a great community. Join the band of brothers on this hero's journey. How we doing? I've never, never heard of that. Yeah. Pretty wild story, but 
you know, you always hear about how, how tall they are. And I've always heard that, you know, when you look at the Great Pyramid, you look at Stonehenge, that, you know, obviously giants had built it. And when you get into, you know, the Book of Enoch, it talks about the advanced knowledge that the fallen angels had and that, you know, these giants were the offspring. But uh, so do you think that uh, the biblical account of how tall they were, you know, like, you know, as tall as cedars, 30 foot tall, do you think that that was a literal thing or is that just, you know, hyperbole or? No, that was hyperbole. Um, even odds bed that they described, I think most, I mean, some people said like 15 foot, but I've heard other people say right around nine foot, nine and a half foot. And since I've never documented any giant more than right up to creeping up on 10, anything that gets into that 11, 12, 13 foot, you're not going to find those in my book because I don't believe those. And especially when you get like 20 foot, you know, that's just getting ridiculous that they would have been so a lot of seven footers, a lot of eight footers, plenty of nine footers, but that seven to nine and a half foot is kind of our sweet spot when we're talking about giant. But, you know, even eight foot, I mean, it's just a monstrous human being. And in the encyclopedia, I document 900. So of all those 900 accounts, all right, let's say 100 of them are were made up or not true. Well, we're still left with 800. And primarily, the giants are in the Ohio Valley. Now, I documented giants in 47 states, but 75% of the giants in that book are in. Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia, um, where you find the tall conical mounds that were surrounded by the ditch. Um, you find the hinges and you find the geometric earthwork that required advanced mathematics uh, to construct. Which um, I was also reading in that same book that basically it was saying that uh, Andrew Jackson was really fascinated with mounds, and he was like one of the first ones to actually do a you know quote unquote professional you know archaeological dig, and I don't have the book in front of me, but I'm pretty sure it was I think it was North Carolina or somewhere like that he had went someplace you know in, in my vicinity and found this large mound and they dug into it and documented everything and even drew out diagrams and that basically the way he described it was you know he said he didn't report finding any giant bones but basically it was like a communal burial place to where they would bury them out and in, in, in a circle and then they cover it up and then you know when other people died they just kept adding on like layers on a cake and, and went up as, as they went so but i've always heard that that the mounds were made just for giants because there was uh indian tradition saying that they warred with these you know red-haired six-fingered giants and then buried them under these large mounds out of fear that they would uh come back well now it may or may not be part of la's presentation but he has, I believe it's a large skeleton um, that was found on Catalina Island and California and especially Catalina Island and all those Channel Islands uh, off of Los Angeles, all full of giants. No more so than, than Catalina, but he's got a photo of a six-fingered uh, giant so i don't know if that'll be part of his presentation or not 
but it's really amazing. And uh, LA has done some uh, really good, uh, really good research on giants, and uh, he has a book on giants as well. But uh, yeah, some of the photos that he's been able to find, and he was able to uh, get a photo from Catalina Island. Then he had somebody like professionally take it apart because it was kind of in a prone position, but his knees were up. But uh, he had that, and it was like over eight foot tall. Like I said, I'm not sure if that's part of his presentation or or not, but uh, he's found some really amazing things. Well, so, uh, well with the as far as like the uh, Native American stories and and things like that of the giants, uh, can you uh, share some of that tradition with us and some of the stories? Well, there are about eight different Native American tribes that talk about a race of giants that once lived in North America and primarily in the Ohio Valley. Uh, five of those say they were light-skinned, red and blonde hair. Um, and this is coming from Joseph Brandt, um, who was a Iroquois chief, um, but very well noted, you know, went to the White House, all that. And that's what he said. He said there was a persistent legend amongst the tribe in that region that at one time there was a white-skinned people that settled here and with permission of the Indians was engaging in, in trade. Now, whether that was copper, I found lead mines that are ancient, um, mica, and whether they were sending that back to the Middle East, we don't know. Um, kind of when you get into the copper mines, it kind of predates some of the stuff in the Ohio Valley. So I think they were coming and going and mining the copper um, during... This is about the Middle Bronze Age, so around 2000 BC or so. But one guy figured that the copper mines at Isle St. Royal in Michigan, which is up in uh, Lake Superior, that it would have taken a thousand men a thousand years to dig those mines. Wow. And there's 500,000 tons of copper that we cannot account for. I mean, yeah, there's some surface finds. You might find a copper bracelet um, that uh, someone in a mound might have had. But we're talking about mining on a massive industrial scale. And, of course, during the Copper Age, you needed copper and you needed tin. And one of the largest tin mines is in England. They're in the uh, southwest portion and not that far from uh, Stonehenge. So a hinge is a circular earthwork with an outer wall and generally a gateway that aligns to a solar event, like uh, Stonehenge aligns to, I think it's the December 21st. Yeah, the winter solstice. Sunrise, or it might be the June 21st sunrise. Of course, they would be opposite. So it would align, if, if in the morning it aligned to the gateway, on December 21st, it would just align on the other side of the gateway, but it would still align with the gateway. So you can, those are somewhat interchangeable. But then the uh, hinges we have, it, 
Indiana and Ohio, those are also aligned to uh, solar vent equinoxes and the different pulses. So again, it's uh, quite a uh, coincidence. And if you look at what they call the uh, copper culture, um, which is around Wisconsin and that, and I don't know, the copper culture is just because of the weapons they found, found, but the weapons of the copper culture are identical to what you would find in the Middle East. So you have, for instance, an arrow that might be six inches long. Well, it's going to have a midrib running through it. Well, a midrib, I mean, that was a, quite a technological achievement, you know, to strengthen it. And then it would have a tang on the end of it, kind of a long tang, where you would haft it to its spear. But in 1500 BC, they developed the uh, socket. So the same socket that we use for shovels and farm implements and hose and your sweeper and everything else. It revolutionized farming but it also revolutionized weapons because if your uh, spear broke, you could reach back and just stick another one of these spearheads on there. Well, in the copper culture, we see the transition from them using tanks to using stockings. So here we have these revolutionary inventions that are being made over in the Middle East and they're being duplicated with fines up around Wisconsin and all that um, where they're saying this copper vulture is and it's like well if they went from the Stone Age into the Metal Age why would they go back to the Stone Age unless they weren't the people making them in the first place. Right. And then people would say, well, they're not bronze. And it's like, well, they have found a couple bronze and they've found a couple bolts. And they were very secretive about their metallurgy. So if you were fighting somebody that was Stone Age, then copper would have been fine. So they wouldn't have to make made uh, bronze implement, copper would have been fine. But the actual design is identical to what you'd find in the Middle East. And if you had a table of them sitting next to one another, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference. So it's quite a coincidence. Yeah. And uh, so with the, the megalithic sites and, and all these advances and stuff that you attribute to, to these giants, these Nephilim, you're saying that it's your belief that it's, uh, I mean, they are tall, but just not as tall as, as some people say. But because I know a lot of people, when they talk about the megaliths, they talk about, oh, well, that's because it was, you know, 12 to 20 foot really strong giants that could lift these stones and do these things. And you get a lot of you know, ancient uh, depictions and stories of that very thing. So, but what, if I believe what you're saying is you're talking about, it's the, uh, the intellect, they were just so advanced in their intellect is how they accomplished all these, these great feats. And obviously, I mean, they were sailing and crossing the seas long before, you know, Columbus and all the recorded history has us doing so. Uh, well, yeah, we know, we know they had surveying skills. In Indiana, there's three sites. There's three hinge sites. They're separated like 20 miles from each other, but drawn on a line, they align to the summer solstice sunrise or sunset, and then to the east, the winter solstice sunrise. 
And then we have the Hopewell Road, which is aligned to the Bright Star of Bromholt. And that went two and a half, three miles. Um, at Newark, Ohio, Geller Hill is like the highest place that's there. And drawing a line from one to the hen to the octagon mound, it's a perfect isosceles triangle. So we know they knew surveying skills, and that would go along with navigation skills. You know, just to be able to draw a line over 60 miles or something like that, you have to surveying and navigation skills or, you know, kind of go one one into the other because, you know, they had to draw that line and keep that bearing. So they were using their nautical skills in some of the layout of the mounds that we find in the Ohio Valley with their alignment with one another. And see, that's the thing is like what you're saying, it makes perfect sense and it connects all the dots of the questions that we have with history. You know, even growing up as a little kid, I seen the pyramids of Giza, you know, they were lined up perfectly, you know, with Orion's belt, you know, and the, the Nile with the Milky Way and then all the way across the the globe on the other side of the sea in south america you got these same pyramids and they all they have astronomical alignments too and you just you know in stone hands you just you have and the serpent imagery i mean it's like this serpent is trying to brand itself throughout the entire world and it's like these places are separated by oceans so if you have something that's saying hey i got a advanced race of people here that could sell and build all these things and I have evidence of them here, 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 and here, you know, it's why would you just blatantly ignore and deny that? Well, it doesn't fit the academic paradigm of the Beringia theory is that 30 people made it their way across the uh, land bridge and those 30 people would be the genealogical root of all Indian in both North and South America. So any kind of theory of other people coming over here is just immediately shot down. And the Native Americans said like uh chief cornstalk now the shawnee have now taken the serpent mound as their own they're saying they built it another shawnee chief cornstalk who's famous he was murdered in west virginia um there's a statue of him at uh point pleasant uh west virginia but he was asked about the mounds and he said, they were here when we got here. And the Shawnee were not here 2000 years ago, but he said they were here when we got here. That's what most of the Native Americans said. They were here when we got here. And most Native Americans except the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Sioux, the Dakota Sioux especially, were not mountain So, I mean, that is just not in their path. And I've looked at the Shawnee religion and nowhere is really the serpent prevalent. And where it is, the serpent was like an evil being. So why would they build that and they would build it to align to the summer solstice sunset. You know, so where did their religion change? They never were mound builders. So it just doesn't, it just doesn't add up. And when did they have 
surveying skills? When do they have the mathematical skills of pi and square root? And to be able to figure out the circumference of a circle. And what I'm referring to is the large hinge at Newark is 3,700 feet in circumference. Adjacent to that is a square earthwork and each side is 925 feet. So 925 times four is 3,700 feet. So the length of the walls represented the same number as the circumference of the circle. And we find that with other earthworks where you have a circle and you have a square where the circle is like the Hopeton work, the circle is 20 acres and the square is 20 acres. Well, you have to know how to square a circle to build that earthwork. And it goes back to real basic, the yin yang. So you wanted this equality between the circle that represented the sun and the square that represented the earth mother or the lunar mother. So you wanted that equality there. You didn't want one having more than the other. You know, too much sun, everything burns up. Too much earth mother, everything floods. So these temples were built with this equality in mind. And we see that over and over again. Now, there is a professor, his name was Ciccini, who has passed away since, I believe, because I've been trying to find him, and I think he's passed away. But he was from MIT, and he evaluated the earthwork in the Ohio Valley and came to the conclusion that they were using the same foot that we are using today. And that is kind of spelled out in what's called gematria, which was practiced by the Amorites. And the two main numbers was 666 represented the sun and 1080 represented the earth mother or the lunar goddess. And we have five earthworks in Ohio that are squares. Each side is 1080 feet. We have two earthworks in Charleston, West Virginia, measured by the Smithsonian. Photos are in the uh, annual report of Smithsonian, and of course they're in my book. The circumference was 666 feet. And I have four of those that were 666. Now, this was another mind-blowing portion of this interview, and it happened very frequently. But when he mentioned the correlation of 666 with the sun, and we know through our scripture, you know, 666 is equated with Satan and the Antichrist. But now that he's tying in this correlation with the sun, it tied in some more loose ends and pointed some more connection dots for me in my mind because even when we talked to Heather Arnold, she was talking about their fascination w with bronze and how that represented you know, the sun, that it was shiny, and that all of her research and evidence that she had found that the giants of Aruba were sun worshipers. Then we have the Serpent Mountain, Ohio. You know, it looks like it, it's swallowing the sun. And, you know, the name Lucifer... You know, which that's not Satan's name, but that means, you know, the, the light bringer, the bringer of the light, the bringer of the the knowledge. So I thought that was pretty cool when I was connecting these dots in my head as he was talking about this. But I think later on I go on about, you know, Gematria and 666, you know, and stuff like that and other correlations. But this was something that I hadn't mentioned and it kind of just come to me as I was editing this. Okay, back to the episode. But a lot of times they use 660 
because 660 was easier to work with with any because they were breaking things down into 420s and 240s. So 420, 420, and 240 gives you 1080, and 420 and 240 gives you 660. So we'll see those numbers, 420s and 240, also within the earthwork. That'll give you a 1080 or a 660. And the Amorites were on a base 12 number system so most of the earthworks in ohio are divisible by either 12 or 6. and again it's just like this can't be a coincidence now could you uh i'm fascinated with the you said the the 666 correlating with the sun or the sun could, yeah 1080 was the uh Okay, yeah, 1080 is the Mother Earth. Now, with, with that 666, now, is that just a uh, like a mathematical equation, or is there like any kind of symbolism with that number that you're aware of? Well, the Amorites had 36 gods, and if you had 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, 5, 6, 34, 35, 36, the sum total of those numbers is 666. Okay. So I, it originated from that. And see, I said That's that Heather Arnold I was talking to uh, about earlier with the Vespucci, she talked about in her research that uh, in the, the graves and stuff that she had found that they've been laid out, people have been laid out like a spoke like or like a wheel and that the giant would be in the center and it would be like spokes on a wheel and stuff and that there was lots of sun imagery and she said that uh, that she it was her her assumption that they were sun worshipers too and like you know i mentioned earlier you just see the serpent stuff everywhere in ohio south america and uh as you were talking my my brain just kind of started turning and made like a little connection let me hold up let me hold up one second here yeah those spoke burials are all over the Ohio Valley. And the two earthworks I just mentioned that are 666 feet in circumference in Carlson, between them was the Creel Mound, which is about 35, 40 foot, was in between these two hinges, 666 feet. One was the line to the east to the winter solstice sunrise and the other one was pointing to the west to the summer solstice sunset but the creole mound there were spoke burials all around and in the center was a guy that was seven and a half almost eight foot so almost identical to what that lady was writing about but we find those spoke burials all over the Ohio Valley. So that's fascinating that over in Aruba or wherever yeah. that that same type of burial. Another coincidence, that, I guess. That cannot be a coincidence. Yeah. These were the same people. Yeah. And yeah, that is a very common burial um, in the Ohio Valley. Not all of them. But uh, I think I documented maybe 40, 40 of those in the Ohio Valley. So pretty prevalent. Yeah, and that's what she was saying, that all the ones they found that way, the, the, the giants that they had found was in the center. And, yeah. Uh, and the ones that weren't giants, she said, were obviously just like prominent people. She said, but they even found little people in some of these barrels. She said whether that was... Uh, you know, a priest or just maybe they honored them as gods because they were abnormal. But she said, but they even found little people buried at the center of some of these spokes too. But Well, that's crazy because in Coshocton County, they found hundreds of these graves not far from a burial mound 
and that's in my book too. There's a very mountain in Coshocton County. And on the hill, just before, behind it, there were all these small people that were three and four foot in length. Wow. And they said they were adults. And then over in Tennessee, they found a graveyard with like a thousand of them. Whoa. And they said that some of them had triangular heads. Almost like they were alien grays. So their skulls were just they said they were triangles. Yeah, like bulbous. And that's why I was, that's why I got excited and was pointing at you because she talked about that too. One of the ones they found had uh, she described it as a bulbous head. It was had uh, basically two crowns that looked like a heart. Uh yeah. They described that their skulls were different. Yeah, were those humans? Right. Or were they aliens? So here's the thing. Now you just to give the audience an idea when I talk about a geometric earthwork over in Ohio. All right, the circle in the octagon in Newark, inside of it is a regulation size golf ball. All right, par fives, par fours, couple par threes. So drive by a golf course and look how big it is. Now imagine a circle and an octagon and every opening in that octagon is aligned to minimum moon set, maximum moon set, different moon things. It's like an 18 year cycle. And each one of those things in the octagon, the openings in the octagon, are aligned to one of these lunar events. And then when you're there, you have a wall, and then you have a mound, and then another wall, part of the octagon. But you look way across in the distance, and you see the ridge of another wall and you ask me, it's like, how did they check their work? I mean, how are they knowing they're building this this perfect octagon when you can't even hardly see the wall on the other side? So just keep that golf course in mind. I mean, how do they build that so perfect? Unless, was there somebody hovering above and instructing them? Or laying a laser grid and like, yep, just put the wall here, then angle it this way, then angle it that way. And the other, like, sea perk work, where it's thousands of feet, and then you have a square. That's another one with 1080 feet. To make this perfect square, well, I mean, try to draw a perfect square just just doodling it it's hard to do to make each side let alone going a thousand foot and not having any angle you know to make your square a little you know off kilter again you have to have surveying skills and so you ask that question about fallen angels it's like well are we talking about Angels, or are we talking about aliens? Because when you talk about these little people that are two and three foot tall with triangular heads, it's like, well, I don't sound human to me. I mean, even now, to be a dwarf is around four foot. Four foot will put you a dwarf, all right? These people were two and three foot. And they had weird heads. So who are they? A lot of questions. Mm-hmm. And I, uh, I talked with uh, Timothy Alvarino a few months back, and I love his outlook on it. You know, he said the problem, he said, with people is they put their limitations on their thinking. He said this, this whole alien fallen angel stuff, he said, 
can be solved, he said, with a simple thought process. He said, if you look up the definition of, of alien or extraterrestrial, he said, it just simply means it's not of this world. He said, and you got the guys like ancient aliens saying we were visited in our past by, you know, extraterrestrials that showed us all this, all this knowledge and helped us build all these, you know, megalith sites and, and give us all these advancements. And then they even interbred with us and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. He said, that's all stuff you read in your Bible. He said, it's Genesis six in the book of Enoch. He says, but he said, where the divide is, is you got people hardline saying, no, they're angels. And you got people that are hardline saying they're aliens. He said, if you just dissolve the, the, uh, the labels, he said, anything not of this earth is an extraterrestrial. He said, so God, aliens, demons, uh, all, all of those things, he said, are not of this world. He said, so by textbook definition, you could call them an extraterrestrial. He said, and your problem is solved. Exactly. So we can call them angels that maybe came down or they were extraterrestrials, but whatever you did, not of this earth. Yeah. And in the book of Enoch, it said that these angels, whether they be extraterrestrial or actual angels, gave the giants knowledge. And we all read in school in third grade, where was the cradle of civilization? Mesopotamia. Well, right. And who was there? Like, who came up with the first laws? Hammurabi. And who was Hammurabi? An Amorite. And what was an Amorite? An Amorite was a giant. What's a giant? A giant is a Nephilim. So all of a sudden, boom, we've got math. We've got this. We've got geometry. We're building ziggurats. I mean, just out of the blue. Now, how does that happen where we go from a pastoral society to all of a sudden building city, building buildings, and all of that? If something didn't happen, if somebody just gave these people this knowledge. So it's all right there. Just one day somebody said, you know, I think I'm going to work on Matthew. And the next thing you know, he's got trigonometry <laughs> and Pythagorean's theorem and square and circles and doing all these other things. Yeah, mapping the stars and string theory. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, throw in some physics in there while you're at it. Yeah. So and then you lose so it all. You know, it's like academic the, the, explanation makes no sense. You can't explain it. That's what I say. It's like after I was done with my research, if it could have been proven they were Native American. If I would have found a Native American tribe that had mathematics in their past, or especially was just overwhelmed by the 18 year lunar cycle, or, you know, uh, the different uh, solar alignment, you know, the Newark uh, hinge is aligned to May 1st. Well, the opposite of May 1st is October 31st. Well, that's all Celtic stuff, you know? It's kind of a legacy from the Amorites because the Amorites were over there, then the Celts came over there. So a lot of the Amorites left England and came over here because the Celts were moving in. But I think the Celts and the Amorites kind of shared the religion so if you look at the Celtic religion, you would be very close to the same religion that you would be seeing that was being practiced in the Ohio Valley. And you see this disseminated through various cultures and, and, and practices. Uh, I've been studying uh, 
Freemasonry here recently. And I got a, it's a nice book. It's a 1928 uh, print of uh, Morals and Dogma by Albert Pike. And it talks about the Scottish Rite and how all this, this, you know, symbolism and esoteric things are passed down through the line. And basically it's the, the, and it's the same thing as these giants. It's the worship of the sun and, and the knowledge. And, uh, it goes into, you know, Pythagoras and the, the, the vibration, you know, the, what do they call it? The music of the, of the planets. And it's just, there's so many, uh, just correlations that, you know, it can't be a coincidence. It, I think it all stems from the same root. Oh, the uh, Masons are all about the Amorites and the numerology. Just their use of the, the number 33. Mm -hmm. Well, 33 is the square root of 1080. And, of course, it's a derivative of 666. Now, people will say, well, no, in the Bible, 666 means, 666 means the devil. And I say, no, not if you read it, it doesn't. Because what it reads is, let he who hath understanding count the number, and that number will be 666. All right, well, first you have to understand, and then you have to count. And who was persecuting the Jews when that uh, quote was made well it was Nero. the Roman it was the Roman well take the Roman numerical system and like the scripture says count you need to count the number 500 150 10, 5, 1, 6, 6, 6. They were talking about the Romans. Because it shows up two other times in the Bible. In one, they bring Solomon 666 talents of gold as tribute. Well, look at the number or the name Solomon. Soul. That's pretty easy. That means sun. On is Hindi for sun. And on, as Akhenaten and many other names in Egyptian uh, pharaohs, on is Egyptian for sun. So really, Solomon means sun, sun, sun. It's like three different names of the sun. And when Solomon built the temple, he built a balcony for the sun worship. So he was all about it. And that's where that number, and there's another quote, there was a guy, Adonakam, and with them when they were fleeing Babylon, he had 666 people with him. Well, his name was Adonakam and Adonis. Again, you have that onward. Adonis was a sun deity with the Greeks, I believe. Mm. So again, we have reference to the sun along with the number 666, which was just a little bit of Babylon creeping into the Bible. But the famous quote in Revelation, now they're talking about the rope. And also, too, I thought it was fascinating that, you know, in that same verse, it said, you know, calculate the number. It said, but it said, it is the number of a man. You know, and when you uh, do the gematria that you were talking about, you know, you get several different possibilities for a name. One is Titan, which is what the Greeks called the Nephilim, giants. Yeah. Uh, another one was uh, Nero, and he was known to persecute the, the, the Jewish people. And also the just the symbology with the Hebrews, the number six was uh, symbolic for humanity or mankind because Adam, you know, Adam was created on the sixth day. And and coincidentally, you know, six is one number short of seven, which is the symbol for perfection. Right. And there's 
in the Apocrypha, those are the books in the Bible that got cut out. Yes. Yeah, you know, Council of The Book of Enoch, Jesus' Bible had the Book of Enoch in it. And Enoch talks about the giants. He talks about how their spirits would be confined to earth, which is why a lot of these mound sites are like supercharged and haunted. And yeah, don't don't miss with that. Have you had any experiences yeah, so, after visiting all these mounds and stuff since you brought it up? I've been to two mound sites with paranormal investigators, and what we found was incredible. And they were even blown away about how much paranormal activity um, was found. And uh, you know those, uh, whoever watches mound shows, they have that one machine where if you point at a person, it kind of makes you a stick figure. But if they're just showing like into like space, all of a sudden a stick figure will show up. Well, I've been to two mound sites and had stick figures like show up right next to. Me. Oh wow! Now what he's talking about there is uh, L.A. Marzulli's uh, seven disc set for uh, on the trail of the Nephilim. They uh, had these paranormal investigators tag along, and they had this equipment that showed, you know, it mapped people, you know, with uh, heat signatures and dots. And so if you had someone standing in front, and they moved around, it tracked everything. But they would pick up these anomalies, and it would have these stick figure looking people and uh, heat signatures like, you know, pretty much like a ghost standing next to you and stuff. So that, that's what he's talking about there, and I think that's on disc three of his set. But also in that very same episode or disc, they brought this uh, thing they called a ghost box, and it would pick up uh, words and stuff like maybe the, the entities or spirits were trying to speak to it. But with this box, they picked up the word evil. Then shortly after, they picked up the word witch. And what was crazy is L.A. said, I would like to try something. So she's like, yeah, go ahead. So he prays in the, you know, the name of Jesus that these evil entities flee and that uh, this machine block them from communicating with them. And after he had finished his prayer, he said, uh, turn off the box and then turn it back on. And they did. And just as soon as they opened the box back up, the word holy showed up. The people's minds were blown. They were like, we've never seen this before. We've seen, you know, evil witch and, and many words associated, you know, to one set, but never go from evil to holy like that. And the prayer obviously worked. Pretty cool stuff. And then their obvious was picking up words like evil satan and all this other stuff and it was crazy and having one of those stick figures it stayed with me for like four minutes and it kept touching me and when i was done i was like so drained of energy i could have just literally like fallen over so if you're a paranormal investigator yeah, you might get your kicks going to a mound site, one of the big mounds that had a giant in it in Ohio, but you might be taking something home with you you can't get rid of. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. Attached to you and follow you home, you got to have a friend you don't want. Well, that can happen. And, well, what's ranked third most haunted place in America is Moundsville Prison. Well, what sits right in front of Moundsville Prison is the Grave Creek Mound, the largest mound in the Ohio Valley. In the lower chamber was a man that was eight and a half foot tall, and in the upper chamber was a woman that was seven and a half foot tall. And they said there's like, yeah, you can sit there at night and there's shadow people walking around that mound. So it's not the prison that's haunted. You're getting spirits from this mound that are going 
into that prison. So it's not some dead prisoner. You have evil entities that are going in there. That's the story. But television is so PC. I've seen three different paranormal investigative teams go to Moundsville, and they didn't show the mound. <laughs> and the mounds were made to be portals for the dead, for them to come in and out of. Because in the book of Enoch, it said, your souls will be confined to earth. Mm -hmm. And the mounds were portals for them to come in and out of. So Now, is that oral tradition? Because I, I, I've not heard that. No, it's in the book of Enoch. Oh, okay. About the, the, the mounds being portals? No, not about the mound. But it says their soul. Oh, yeah. Was he confined to earth? Yeah, they were neither human nor angels, so uh, th their soul had no place for rest, and they'd be uh, basically just tormenting spirits on earth forevermore. Yeah, they're here. And they are around those mountains. But no. you do not, you do not want to mess with them because any kind of divination, and especially going there as a uh, paranormal team, you are going to pick up some bad thing, really bad thing. So don't do it. I can tell you that firsthand. Don't do it. Now, uh, Heather had mentioned uh, with the uh, skulls and stuff that she had run into and that they had studied was that uh, the the density of the bones were, were thicker and that even uh, right here around their eyebrows were, were protruding out longer and some of them even had double rows of teeth. Uh, uh, have you run into that with some some of your studies and what's your your theories behind that because I always thought it was fascinating with the brow line because I had read that that's the only bone in your body that doesn't stop growing so like when you see the bones of Neanderthal man and stuff like that where they got these really big brow bones you know to me I was like well that must show that they lived a long time because that's the one bone that doesn't stop growing Well, I would say that 70% of giant skeletons are described as having a protruding brow ridge, a sloping forehead, a massive jaw, and many times they remark on the thickness of the skull. So everything that lady just described is absolutely true from the burial type to the skull type is exactly what you're going to find in the Ohio Valley. Protruding brow ridge, sloping forehead, massive jaw, double rows of teeth. Uh, in the encyclopedia, I don't know, I have maybe 40, 50 double rows of teeth. So, and then there was a few, only about five or six, that actually had uh, bony protrusions coming out of their forehead. Like horns? Like horns. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's just insane. But we do have the... Now, so I'm not saying that all of them had horns. Like I said, I only have five or six accounts. And they weren't very long. It wasn't like they were like five inches sticking out of their head. They were just bony protrusion, probably a couple inches. But they were sticking out of their head. So there are some instances of that. What I find fascinating is that you keep referring to this lady and what she found. And um, it's all identical to what she so I have about it. But 70%, I call them Neanderthal hybrids just because of the bony structure on the brow ridge and the fact 
that their skull slanted back. Uh, they look more Neanderthal. And then a lot of the skulls, too, they describe with an occipital bun, which would be more of a Neanderthal. And uh, there's something else on there, and I can't think of the name, so I'm going to drop it. Uh, but, uh, yeah, everything that she found in that mound is, like, spot on, all the way down to the uh, the little person with the weird skull. That's just crazy. Yeah. I might have to holler back at her and all three of us get on and just talk one day, because I, I, I guarantee you she's found a lot more that coincide with with your findings that we just probably didn't get around to talking to <laughs> well i think that would be fascinating because i can't believe what this lady has found on aruba because it all duplicates itself in the ohio valley yeah so it's obviously those people in the ohio valley in the ohio valley that was uh in aruba yeah, and what was funny, she she said that uh, when she got to studying and uh, trying to figure out, you know, she said, I had no hint of giants you know, or anything like that. She said, I was just trying to find out history about Aruba and Kursal because I was going to do a tour. I was going to, you know, get Jeep and Harley Davidson tours, and I wanted to give people, you know, historically correct data about the place. She said, so I started reaching out to, you know, locals and historians and stuff like that. And she said, and I was talking to this one gentleman, and he was a historian, and she said, and like out of nowhere, he just started like freaking out on her, and then he, she said that he just started like raising his voice, and he's like, there are no giants on Aruba, there's never been any giants in Aruba, you know, and just like going belligerent, you know, and she said, I was like, oh my God, I've not even mentioned giants, she said, so then my first thought was, is there must be giants in Aruba. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to my world. Yeah. Well, see, that's funny because at Grave Creek, there's a uh, museum. And there's a big sign right when you walk in. There never was any giants. There was never any giants found in this map. There were never any giants found anywhere. This is big disclaimer about giants. And I have a photo before that museum was built. It was the Del Nora Museum. And they had on display a skeleton that was seven foot two in the museum. And when they, in the 1830s, there was a guy who actually dug into the side of Grave Creek. And the earth is packed so tight in there that he built the museum and he displayed the eight and a half foot giant was on display in that mound. Well, L.A. and I were walking out of the museum and they had a lithograph that had to date from like the 1840s but it showed the giant that was on display within that mound. And it was like, oops, this lady didn't know what she was doing because you're not supposed to release stuff like that. I mean, they have all these signs about giants and there's a picture of a giant skeleton being displayed in the mound that they're saying there's no giants in. That's so, a Photoshop. That's a Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what people try to say. They actually, some archaeologists went into Photoshop and shrunk the shrunk the thing in the background, and then said, "Look, it's no bigger than the guy that's standing in front of it." And it's like, well, you Photoshop the to make it agree with what you're. It's like, ah, you know. How do you deal with these people? Yeah. And these are the same people that, you know, tell you trust the science and uh, here's the missing link to the evolutionary chain. And then later you find out it's a bunch of monkey bones and pig bones. It's just, you know, a smorgasbord of, of stuff they've slapped together to try to lie to you. 
you know, countless times. Lucy, Peltdown Man, you know, but we're we're to tr- we're supposed to trust these people. Yeah, and they've never found the missing link. And I'll tell you, the closest thing to the missing missing link is the um, skulls of the giant with the protruding brow ridge and all that stuff. I mean, they are, like I say, I call them Neanderthal hybrid. And I always see that as a, a de-evolution because I've talked with friends and, I, and they're like, you know, well, if the giants are real, you know, what, why are they lying about it? And, I, and I've told them, I said, well, my theory is, number one, anything that proves the Bible as historically correct, they want to avoid that. And then number two, it goes against Darwin's theory that everybody and all these guys have went millions of dollars of, of debt in and, and sold the lie to everybody else in all these institutions and schools. So then they'll have to rethink everything. I said, because if giants are real, it shows the exact opposite. It shows that we ain't getting better and bigger. We're, we're you know what I mean? We were bigger, better, stronger back then. We are de-evolving. You're absolutely right. De-evolution. Modern man was not as smart as these Amorites were. And if we are looking at genetic manipulation, then it would make sense that the uh, skulls would be different. Well, Fritz, uh, I ain't going to keep you all day, man, because I'm telling you, I could be on here with them for at least another hour or two with you and tie you up for the rest of the afternoon. <laughs> yeah, well, we covered a lot. Before I go, go ahead and give your plug and uh, let everybody know where they can find your material and your and your website and where they can find your work. Uh, well, I'm on Amazon. Just put in Fritz Zimmerman, but the Encyclopedia of Ancient Giants, uh, the Nephilim Chronicles, Fallen Angels. In that, I go deep into the evolution and uh, skulls and all that and Shamatra and I really make the link in the Nephilim Chronicles to see all the mound Nephilim Chronicles travel guide histories of ancient America just crazy stories that I've come across over the years that really didn't belong in the giant books but it's just incredible things story after story uh, mysteries of ancient America um, I have another book coming out in about another month or so. Oh, cool. I think that's going to be amazing discoveries of ancient America. It'll be different than mysteries. Uh, but, uh, yeah, all those books are available on Amazon. Amazon. There you guys have it. The man, the myth, the legend, Fritz Zimmerman had such a good time in this conversation such a knowledgeable guy and all the experiences he had it was just nice to sit down with him and pick his brain but I know for those that's not followed me with the Dick Bible Podcast might be unfamiliar with Heather Arnold and I mentioned her several times on this episode I'm going to reach out to Heather and talk to her again there's several people that I've talked to in the past that I could just do an entire Giants a month so I think that'd be pretty cool but thanks for coming along on this hero's journey with me, guys. I'm going to sign off for now. But until next time, torches high. If you guys enjoyed this episode, share it with a friend. Help us to grow the show. And uh, if you're listening to us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, give us a rating. Stuff like that helps our show grow. It actually helps us get guests in the future. Appreciate you guys for listening.